Hello and welcome to Technopolis. I will have a brief word in Greek and continue in English. Αξιότιμοι κύριοι αντιδήμαρχε, αξιότιμες κυρίες και κύριοι, σας ευχαριστούμε θερμά που βρίσκεστε σήμερα εδώ μαζί μας για να συζητήσουμε το ζήτημα των αστικών μετασχηματισμών μέσα από το παράδειγμα της πόλης της Αθήνας και μέσα σε αυτό το διήμερο συμπόσιο. Καθώς το συμπόσιο θα διεξαχθεί στην αγγλική γλώσσα, θα συνεχίσω στα αγγλικά. I will continue in English. A wonderful good evening to you all. Welcome to the two-day symposium Transforming Athens Urban Landscapes at the Technopolis in Athens. We would like to welcome the guests that are joining the event online as well. The event will be recorded. My name is Tassos Roidis. I am an architect and landscape architect, research and teaching associate at the Technical University of Munich, Chair of Sustainable Urbanism, and the project leader of the Inner Urban Landscapes of Athens Research and Teaching Project, together with Mark Michaeli, Norbert Kling, Panagiotis Turnikiotis, and Panita Karamanea, I have been organizing the symposium. The symposium under the title Transforming Athens Urban Landscapes aims to contribute productively, excuse me, and perhaps with some optimism that the discussion for a better future always brings to the broader debate on the restructuring of our cities towards a healthier, greener, more sustainable, more equitable and resilient environment. Maybe you will see it later. Fundamental issues related to the transformation of Athens will be discussed. How can we respond to climate change and spatial inequalities? How can we turn the lack of spatial resources and conflicting goals and interests into a catalyst for new approaches and partnerships? How can new models of partnerships can be created to share knowledge and turn this knowledge into action? The book, Taking Action, Transforming Athens Urban Landscapes, which deals with the above issues and more, will be presented at the event later today. Greek and international experts from the fields of architecture, landscape architecture and urban design, academic researchers and professors, as well as representatives of the municipality of Athens who are actively involved in the transformation of the city, participate in the symposium to share their experiences and present their approaches on current and future urban changes. The symposium is part of a, of a series of research, research activities and public events organized by the TUM in collaboration with the National Technical University of Athens since 2021 and was made possible thanks to the generous support of the Schwarz Foundation. The event is also supported by the city of Athens today. Now comes the next slide. The structure of the symposium is divided in four main sections. Today, session one and two. Session one, transforming Athens urban landscapes. Mark Michaeli, Panagiotis Turnikiotis, myself and Norbert Kling, will present the outcomes of our three years program seen from different perspectives. In the second session, we will begin with a keynote lecture by Regina Kella, who made it on time to Athens, and will continue with a moderated discussion and reflection on the Athenian context with Elisabeth Bargiani, Panita Karamanea, and Ivina Nopoulou. It will be moderated by Mark Michaeli. You're all afterwards invited for a wine outside at the end of today's event. Tomorrow, you can see it on the right side, is tomorrow. Uh, it won't be in Athens, as it says here, it will be again on the same place. We'll be continuing at the same time and place, slightly different setup, going into project ideas and suggestions for future collaborations. We'll be starting with two representatives from the city of Athens, Ekaterini Diamesi and Evangelia Krali, discussing future plans for and from Athens. In the third session, we have invited Tilemachos Andrianopoulos, Irini Leopoulou and Lukas Triandis to have a short input and afterwards discuss with Panita Karamanea and myself about the planning and implementation of new urban projects in Athens and Europe. Georgine Theodore, professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology and partner at Interboro, will be holding an online key lecture after this session. The fourth and last session will be discussing matters of governance and urban regeneration. For that reason, we have invited Michalis Woudis, Dimitris Poulios, and from the city of Munich, Katra, Katja Stroheka, this is also with us today, thank you. And the day will be closing with comments on the two-day symposium by Panagiotis Turnikiotis and Mark Michaeli. This whole program would have not been possible without the generous support of the Schwarz Foundation, with over a period of three years funded, a range of research, teaching, and networking activities focused on issues of sustainability and green urban transformation. 
This funding helped us to establish and maintain an intensive dialogue about current and future challenges in Athens, its metropolitan region, and the broader context. We would particularly like to thank Hyona Xanthopoulou Schwartz, co-founder and executive director of the Schwartz Foundation, for her enabling and supporting role throughout the whole project, since it was her who encouraged us to keep our focus on Athens. We would also like to thank the whole team of the Schwarz Foundation of Athens and Munich, Alexandros Tanas, Sergio Zalmas, Teresa Premauer, and Adelheid Michel for getting things up and running and supporting our work in many different ways. So thank you for not only being a supporter of the project, but also for your engagement throughout the whole project. At the National Technical University of Athens, Panagiotis Tournikiotis acted as lead partner of the project. He helped us to set up the joint research and teaching activities and was directly involved in all the events that took place in Athens and some in Munich. This project would not have happened, would not have been possible without your invaluable expertise, academic and organizational support. Also warm thanks to Christos Kritikos, who is not here yet, uh, who has been always supporting us through the whole program in every possible way. So a warm thank you from, to all of you from us and some closing thank you. We're also grateful to Maria Yorgopoulou, director of the Gennadius Library of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, for acting as an affiliate to the project and providing institutional support and valuable knowledge on Athens. Last but not least, we would like to warmly thank the city of Athens, the mayor Kostas Bakoyanis, the vice mayor, who is also sitting with us today, Vasilios Fibos Axiotis, and the collaborating team of the mayor, especially Yorgos Yanyos. Thank you for supporting this event and hosting us in this beautiful space here at Technopolis, and for actively participating with your team both days. Also, thank you very much to all who are here or are online, and uh, we're very happy to see and exchange ideas with you and thoughts. So I will hand over to you, Vice Mayor Vasilios Fivos Axiotis, Vice Mayor for Urban and Building Infrastructure and City Planning, for a brief greeting. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Vasilis Fivos Axiotis, I'm the Vice Mayor for, uh, oh, I'm sorry about that. I think I'm touching buttons here or not? No. no. Did I, I am I going to touch that for a couple of days? Okay. Okay, so again, uh, we are engineers, so we're, we're solving problems. <laughs> so my name is Vasilis Vivos Axiotis. I'm, uh, I'm not only vice mayor for urban uh, infrastructure, building infrastructure and city planning of the city of Athens. I'm also a civil engineer. Uh, I finished National Technical University of Athens. I went to Columbia uh, in New York. I did my second master's, and of course, I did also an MBA in Harvard Business School. So please excuse me for my Greek or English, if it's not understood. Uh, but, nevertheless, I would like to open my salutation by setting an example here that uh, I would like to share it with you because it's the actual foundation of what we are doing. Oh, thank you. I'm more than an engineer rather than a politician. <laughs> so, uh, if I, I, I was saying that I would like to open uh, the salutation by giving an example of a strong signal that happened today in my office when I received a phone call from uh, one of uh, the leaders of our, our division. I'm, I'm in charge of three divisions in Athens, uh, as I said, uh, urban infrastructure, building infrastructure, and city planning. So a principal uh, called me today and said, why did you say only to two uh, engineers, uh, members of the technical department of one of the division, to come in this conference and address a speech. And I said, because I, I thought that that would be something that you didn't want to, and maybe I was giving too much uh, of, uh, you know, load work. Uh, no, we wanted our division as well to come and showcase and highlight what we are doing as well as part of the team which are uh, we're transforming Athens. So that 
is a strong signal from a technical service perspective of the city, of what we are doing as a family, starting from the mayor to the vice mayor and to all uh, engineers uh, into technical service of Athens, that we are committed to serving the vision of the mayor uh, that is to transform Athens. Having said that, dear participants, on behalf of the mayor, Mr. Bakoyanis, I would like to welcome you all to this auditorium, which has a name. Uh, it's uh, called Auditorium Miltiades Evert. He was a mayor here in Athens back in 1995, and he was uh, deemed to be the mayor who started transforming Athens. One of the mayors, actually, who did significant things in transforming Athens. Um, having said that, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the mayor, and uh, I would like to uh, say to, uh, that I will not join the, your conference, but I would like to express uh, to Mr. Reidis that I would like the minute in order to share it with everybody that we can, because apart from the technical side, we are, from this auditorium, giving a strong signal to the people who voted us that, yes, we are determined to change Athens, to transform Athens. So, I'm extremely ha happy to be here today among so many knowledgeable and distinguished guests. Let me begin by stressing that in Athens, sustainability is an extremely important part of the city's development policy. First of all, both the built and the natural environment is characterized by its high ecological, economic, and social value. Therefore, it is, it is even more important to take measures, solid me measures, for the maintenance and preservation of our environment. We aim at upgrading the quality of life while res respecting our natural environment. We aim at upgrading the Athenians' quality of life by promoting sustainable development, ensuring social cohesion, protecting the natural environment, while also improving at the same time the urban environment. Athens, as we all understand and all know, is a highly dense populated area with more buildings, while supporting and reinforcing natural resources are paramount importance for us, for the development of the city of Athens and specific of public spaces through urban reconstruction. The sustainable built environment is one of the main priorities for Athens as a contemporary European city in the 21st century. Urban redevelopments are made always keeping in mind environmental, spatial, social, and of course economic parameters, aiming at the sustainable development of, the, of these areas through the reconstruction of the urban landscape and of course, a sustainable urban life. Open, open urban spaces are already reconstructed and replanned in the framework of sustainability and based on the principles, of course, of architecture. Mr. Turnigotis would kill us we didn't do so. <laughs> to be more specific, streets and squares are being upgraded by our city's technical services, using water as a structural and a synthetic tool of architecture using bioclimatic materials in paving more green areas, such as Panepistremiu uh, Street, Armenian Square, or Madrid Square. The complete redevelopment of Licabetus and Streffy Hill with anti-flood works, and of course, the pilot application of, of innovative and ecological materials while restoring the walking route using nat natural materials. The area of Votanikos, the area of Vatanikos urban planning will be upgraded and it will acquire modern infrastructure with roads, public areas, and green spaces in the near future. And of course, the second phase of the double regeneration area, which includes the creation of a large urban par park, excuse me, on Alexandras Avenue. Also, with the Adopt Your City program of the municipality of Athens, any interested party, such as institutions, agencies, businesses, residents, can also adopt a street, a park, a square, a playground, a stadium, a neighborhood to make them brighter, greener, and of course more friendly for residents and visitors. So having said that, large and small projects in central parts of the capital 
as well as in neighborhoods, are among the plans of the municipality of Athens for our near future. Free spaces are extremely important in city planning and environmental planning as well, as all public must meet both the needs of the biochromatic planning of the urban space and the needs of the inhabitants of the urban fabric. Environmental design in a city's urban fabric and green spaces focuses on the environmental parameter of the design. So the concept of urban regeneration is directly interwinked with the concept of development and progress. Lastly, any initiative, consultation, or discussion at the shared meeting and the development of multiple ideas and creative thoughts for the adoption of policies and measures for the transformation of urban landscapes contributes to the city's development by using an integrated planning system while, of course, upkeeping the principles of safety, equality, hygiene, biclimatic building, as well as, of course, environmental and ecological providence. Thank you very much, and I hope all the best to your meeting. I don't know how long you will be staying, because you said you have to go almost immediately. Okay. So although the book launch didn't happen yet, you will get now your first, the ah, first. Ah, thank you, thank you. Um, the first book thank you very for much. you. Thank you. Although the book will be presented in uh, in a short while thank by you, my colleague you. Norbert Klink, whom I don't thank see you. now. Thank you. Ah, there he is. But I hope you enjoy it, and of course the municipality will get another two. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. You. Thank you, Vice Mayor, Mr. Axiotis, for being with us. Um, you can see a second name standing here. Irini Klabatsea, who is the Dean of the Architecture School of the NTUA, who excused herself today. She unfortunately cannot join her, but she sent a short note for me to read, so I will do so, uh, as a greeting from her side. Dear colleagues and friends, on behalf of, of the NTUA School of Architecture, I'd like to thank the organizers of the Transforming Athens Urban Landscape Symposium. The various research activities and public events contribute significantly to the enrichment of the current discussion of crucial issues involved at the, at the teaching, research, and socio-political level in terms of the transformations recording in the urban space, and in particular in the city of Athens. I am sure that visible that visible but also invisible aspects of the transformations of urban landscapes and the complex mechanisms of production of new spaces in and for the city will emerge. The approaches that highlight the multi multifactoral structure of these transforming new urban landscapes that include historicity, multiculturalism, architecture, urban planning and design, shifting socioeconomic and spatial inequalities, creativity under the regime of new challenges such as climate change, are eagerly awaited. The resilience, the investment plans, the hunt for new identity of the city, the creation of new micro landscapes within the urban space experienced until now. The role of legislation, planning tools, governance from local to European level, participation, are equally crucial fields of interpretation, documentation and discussion. Flexibility, adaptation, Feedback in terms of decision making, whose implementation transforms or can transform urban landscapes, seem to be key points of the relevant processes. The School of Architecture participating in this project will capitalize on the findings and conclusions of the scientific work, continuing in its time-honored understanding of the need to osmosis the architect's education with the real and contemporary needs of the city and of the society. I wish you a very successful symposium. Irini Klabatsea, Associate Professor NTUA, Dean of the School of Architecture NTUA. We thank her for that. Um, and now I will just hang over, hand over to Mark Michaeli for the first session to start. Maybe you all have a program now in your hands. So hello everybody, ladies and gentlemen. 
My name is Mark Michaeli. I'm the chair for sustainable urbanism of Technical University of Munich, and it's a very, very big honor for me to be here. It's a very important um, symposium for us because um, several things will happen over the next two days. We will make a resume of what happened over the last three years. Tess has already told you that we had a lot of support to produce some new knowledge, which is important for us as scientists. Um, that we had a lot of meetings with interesting people which are willing to take responsibility for the, for the future urban change. We met people from the city which are very openly also communicating to us what is already going on. Um, and, and I think this is also one important goal for today, we have to find out what the next steps are. And so I want to give you as a kind of introduction just a very brief flyover in about 10, 12 minutes so that you have an idea what this conference is about. I will not go in the, in the single uh, contributions. Uh, you read the list before. But I want to give you some idea why we are here and why for us coming from Munich it's important to work with European essence. Um, I was trained as an architect at Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in 2010. I took over the chair for sustainable urbanism at TUM, which is actually in the Department of uh, Architecture. The Department of Architecture then again is part of the School of Engineering and Design. And some two years ago, I was appointed Dean of Studies or Dean of Student Affairs, it's called officially, um, for the entire engineering and design branch. And in this field, I realized that if we want to tackle transformation, we have to do much more than just doing projects. We have to think whether this mode of work in the future will work. We have to find out whether from history we can learn something. We have to look more specifically to spaces. And, and this is for me the most important, we have to hand over this knowledge to open this knowledge up to the young people, the ones which have to make this transformation happen over the next generations. So it was very important for me not to sit around with all these old white men, professor, so you understand I'm talking about myself, maybe also about you, Panayotis. But for me, it was very, very, very um, um, uh, important to talk to the young scientists, which will be the teachers of tomorrow, the scientists of tomorrow, the ones which are making in the city which are making the city, and then to talk with the students to open up a completely new field of knowledge, which until now was very limited, at least when you're studying architecture, landscape architecture, urbanism, or any other field of engineering, because engineers are typically very much concentrated on products. And I think we have to learn something else to make this transformation happen. How to explain this, especially how to open a, um, a conference if the leader of the program, which was Tassos Oides and uh, Norbert Kling, who um, was mainly responsible for the book publication, give you this title for your presentation, Urban Urgencies in Europe. When it comes to the different crises, we all experience a moment, be it the climate crisis, be it uh, an economic crisis, be it the corona crisis, you can name it. Um, then we very often talk about, we show disastrous images and saying, well, we really have to change something. But what do we have to change? And I think what we have to change is very, very well shown in this image. And this is the image uh, of Jordi Bernardo from 2004, which I typically use for opening my lecture series at TUM. What can you see? You can see on this lorry, obviously, a print, a kind of marketing uh, thing, photograph. Um, which is showing a very nice landscape, a man-made landscape in the foreground, nature in a kind of safe distance, embedded in this man-made used green landscape. We have a town, a walled town, so it's not spreading out into the landscape. And then in the far back, we have a village embedded in this agricultural, cultural landscape. So obviously, this is what we're dreaming of. Otherwise, this Swiss knife company would not use it for marketing purposes. But then they load their knives in this lorry and distribute it all over Europe. And the landscape which comes out of this economic model is what you see on the right side. So this landscape is produced by our dreams, distributed all over the world, and it makes the world kind of flat. We don't know whether this photograph was taken in Spain, 
in Germany, in Switzerland, or in Greece. We cannot tell. So obviously, we should not only design these new objects, and this I tell the engineers and, ar and architects, but we have to change a little bit the mode of production of space if we really want to reach this point. And you could say, yes, Mark, but you know, now you're talking about Swiss, nice Swiss landscapes, and this is not our biggest problem. But just imagine if the image is this, if we want to reach the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Then that would be catastrophic if we could not reach it because the mode of production is the wrong one. And, and so I feel an obligation really to say, well, this is what should work. There is no option to fail. And we as scientists, as developers, as engineers, as planners, we have to find out how to make it work to change the mode of producing these objects, to, um, to imagine the, the futures. This is relatively easy if you think about new structure. I just show you some images from university on the right, some two students projects uh, which won a very big national award on, let's say, the new green city, also tackling social uh, problems with um, affordable housing, with um, social activity in the streets, with new forms of city landscape. I mean, I mean a little bit of kind of romantic image, right? But it's easy if you build new structure, but if you have to apply this new mode of production of space to already existing structure, it's getting more tough. Why? You can see from the green arrow why. Because you have already people living there. You cannot evict them from the place. You cannot push them out. They have to make a decision. They have to welcome this green transformation. They want to be part of the project. If they are not willing to be part of the project, if we, we don't give them the chance to be part of the project, it will never happen, at least not in the already existing cities, like Athens. The problem is that a lot of people don't understand how complicated this process is. Even the architecture students don't. They think, okay, maybe building a new water infrastructure for collecting water, for um, irrigating the trees in the, in the street, for uh, even protection from, uh, rainfall, uh, from rainfalls, etc. This is something which can be arranged by the city. So this is a pub it's done by the public works, not very difficult. Planting for trees should not be that difficult. We did it for centuries. And two roof gardens, yes, in Athens, we might find some people who want to open the roof gardens or do some sponge gardens on the roofs. And this we call transformation. And you see from the left to the right image, the city looks much greener and maybe it's better. The problem is the real process looks like this. So first, maybe you can find a spot where you can plant a tree, easy thing. Then the second step is even more tricky because you maybe have to make a substitute building, the red one here. You have to find a plot, you have to acquire it, you have to maybe move some people from another building which then has to be taken down to the new place first. And only then, this spot here in the front is available for planting these two trees. So now, this is not only a public project. You have to talk to landowners. And I tell you, the most successful cities like Paris in urban transformation, they are exactly doing this. They are partnering up with the private to develop a kind of powerful strategy of transformation. The next thing is to cut a tree. And now we're ending up in a public discussion, which is a very, very um, difficult one, because somebody told us to plant four trees, but for planting four trees, maybe sometimes you have to cut one first. So there will be some people against it. There will be tough discussion about it. How can you justify to cut this tree when we're saying we need more trees? And so on and so on. So this process, which looked very easy, is very complicated because you have to involve different groups. You have to make a lot of tough decisions. And they only can be made if you still have this ultimate goal in mind that you're saying, but in the end, it will be better. But is it better for everybody who's taking part in these decision processes? Architects and urban planners very often are not aware about this. So they're designing things, but they don't understand that most of these projects cannot be realized because they don't know 
who make the decisions, at what time, and what's the timeline of it. So indeed, when talking to my architecture students and urbanism, I, I tell them very often, we, uh, if we want to reach a kind of equilibrium of social spatial urban transformation processes, we have to have the spatial elements and protection of space in mind, but we also have to be, have in mind whether society really can make it alone, where we can just say, well, for example, the public works, they will execute all these things, or whether we need to come up with new agreements between the individual, sometimes also accepting something decided by the neighbor, which I would never do like this, but maybe in the end is beneficial for the, for the equilibrium. This is a tricky thing to talk with architects and urbanists about. However, I think it's time really to change our teaching, our scientific work into this direction. And so this taking action is not just a fancy title. I think it's a really a self-commitment of a lot of young scientists. Norbert will fly through the book in a very brief presentation soon. Um, that these scientists really want to contribute to develop this new practice of transforming the city but they need also the support of the city, they also need the support of the citizens. Some more ideas about this in a second. Indeed, we have to start with a strategic idea. I told you, first you need to know what is the ultimate goal. But what I show you here, which is a kind of strategic city development plan of the city of Munich, it's called Step 2040, and this will be shown again in the presentation later with a lot more details. This is a very interesting plan because it's not really saying we do project X here or project Y there, but it's given, it's, it's uh, communicating, um, let's say, the larger givens, the larger structures we have to negotiate. And what I personally like my, most about this plan, by the way, City of Munich worked very long on this plan, so the last one was from the 1980s, and now we understand that we need such a plan again for the year 2040. What I like most about the plan, there's not only one dimension in there. So it's also talking about the just development of the city, not only the green development of the city. With a lot of money, with new people living in the city, again, it's relatively easy to make the city green. But is it what we want? Definitely not. It's talking about infrastructural development. It's talking about a new arrangement of social structures in the city, etc. But we have Katja Strohecker here. I hope that she will um, give us some more detail about it. And I also know that Regine Keller is pointing out to this um, plan, which was published first in 21, the, uh, in a kind of preliminary version. This is what you see here. Uh, maybe in the other presentations, you will see the final version of it. Um, however, um, uh, for us, it's very important to have this plan, because on this basis, which is also a kind of political statement, we want this, we can make a lot of arrangements, even on very small scale. But the next steps have to be made. And as I said, there are some cities which are well advanced and are very often showing the city of Paris. Paris is a really strange city because it's relatively small and you can isolate it from the rest of the region through the boulevard Peripherique. Um, so it's relatively easy to say Paris ends here. And when you look into this concept, it's strange enough that these concepts very often end exactly at the boulevard Peripherique, while in the Munich plan, they also cross the borders of the city into the environments. But why is the Paris plan so remarkable? Because what they did is, upper left, they really started to build knowledge. So they committed to do the plan. That was a political statement. They built up knowledge in G on GIS space. They discussing options, how to develop some strategic, um, strategic um, corridors in the city, then they are also doing something which is not very typical for, um, for uh, politics, saying we are really bad in these areas. So they're not only saying we are good, but they're saying in these areas, marked in green, and uh, not marked in green, but in, in purple, there's more potential, let's think about it. Now the next thing that they are doing it, they are also saying there are some spaces which might be better to be developed because the leverage will be higher. So we have to invest very few and the result will be very, very big. Then they're coming up with projects, with hundreds of projects, which then will be executed one by one. No really large projects, 
one large commitment, one large idea for the city of Paris, and then a thousand singular green deals. This is interesting because this also allows for making all these arrangements between the private and the public. And indeed, the Paris plan is maybe the first one not only showing public green infrastructure, but the private one, which is the blue, what you see here. And you see, okay, the private gardens, they're growing to the edge of the city. Paris, as well as Athens, is very, very dense in the inner core, but then you have a lot of green structure you can build on. But you also have to secure that it's not disappearing in the future, like, for example, it's happening in, in Munich. So, indeed, this, I think, is the strategic step which has to be reached in the future to understand how we can activate the entire space. And this is why, at my chair, we're also doing some research work on how to integrate these spaces. What you can see on the right side, it looks like very, very simple drawings, how to integrate the front gardens, the, um, the frontages of the buildings into the green infrastructure, but it's important to do so. And you can see in Athens, in this very, very cramped city situation with very, very few, few space, we have to learn how to build, for example, a green corridor through planting some trees in the public space, but then one or the other also has to be in the private space. How do we do it? It's not, not a simple thing. But in Paris, they're doing something else which is very important. They are doing really serious research, but they are also precasting in these kind of scenarios what will this space be alike in the future. And this is where they collaborate with the universities and with the students. They ask the, invite the students, we give you some ideas what about the city, what we are doing. What do you think if you make the designs and then we are evaluating the designs? And these studies here were the one I showed before. This is from 2020. These are nine years older where they collaborated with the University of Versailles. Um, and the students made a kind of explorative study of what will the public space be about in the future. Delivering on small street scenes, just observing with the power of the students. Students are very excited in doing this. They learn what things are happening in the street. And if they understand what's happening in the street, and not only on paper, they also learn maybe about these processes which could be could be um, successful in the future. And for the city, it was very good when then making these decisions, you see, on a quarter, on a neighborhood scale, also to know, okay, what kind of public things maybe will promote our process, catalyze our process, which will be problematic. So the city is also benefiting from this collaboration. But I think the best, the biggest uh, mutual benefit is really that by this you, you um, give the students a chance to contribute to this process. They will work on this for their entire career, their entire lives. So let's include them as soon as possible and tell them, yes, you can design. Give them the chance. These people in the end will commit to this larger project of society, of community. Indeed, we are also doing these projects in the left. It's Budapest uh, in the east, and in the right, it's a project we did in Paris. And with architecture students, with students from um, um, social sciences, mapping um, the way how people really make the city usable for them. And what's surprising is how informal these processes happen. But however, how important it is, for example, in city landscape design, how to place the objects in the streets. We learn that with a certain arrangement, it's easier to adapt this space. It's easier to stay in the spaces. So the architects, the designer, they are the right people to address. However, in the end, the product is no, not always about designing a house. And what is the mutual benefit for the city? Yeah, they're getting access, not only to the talents, but to this kind of new ideas in the city for this thousand projects, because it's not so easy. And I think Regina will show a little bit more about such a project where you're not only doing one project for one space, but a hundred one. You need this power of students, intellectual power, creative power for doing so. So this is an invitation by the university to the city to collaborate on this, to make these think tanks happening. And indeed, we learned from a presentation of Josep Bojigas, who is the head of planning of Barcelona Regional. He was here in our last conference here in Athens uh, in May 22. 
And he said, yeah, in the end, you need to work in very, very different dimensions. My former boss, Chris Christians, who is also a very well-known um, uh, urban designer, um, he said, you have to play simultaneous chess. So it does not make sense only to play on one board, which is econ economical development or ecological one, but you have to play on all the boards at the same time and you have to win all the games. So be aware that you really think about the entirety, and this is what jo uh, Josep also told us for Barcelona, showing us this diagram in the right where you can see the different dimensions where they are working on. For example, working on the metropolitan scale. For Athens, I think it's also critical to do so. Recover neighborhoods, make the streets more lively, make the whole thing more eco-friendly, et cetera, et cetera. And then he named all these projects. In total, in the year 2022, 650, he told me, which are happening at the same time in the city of Barcelona. So this is a map of Barcelona, Badalona municipality to the east, the Mediterranean Sea to the south. 650 projects, and only few of them really run by the city, and most of them in a very novel arrangement also with privates. What can we learn from all these kind of international examples for Athens? My problem is I'm not a specialist in Athens, and I will leave it to my Greek colleagues later on in the discussion and the presentation of Panayotis I'm really looking forward to, um, also to say what can we learn from this for Athens? But we can speculate about it. And one of my students, he's also here, Spiro, where are you? There are you, right? Um, he did it in his master thesis. He said, for example, maybe we can uncover some structures which are now hidden by this endless concrete city structure. We all just thought about making infrastructure and houses, but there's a landscape beneath. There's a kind of relief of the territories beneath. Maybe this can help us to, for example, um, solve our problems with um, stormwater events. And he made a project, it's a speculation, so it's not realized. In the north, maybe you recognize the motorway coming from, from the airport and then going to Elefsina. And he found out that there are a lot of creeks, and you can see them in the, in the street grid. And if you open, if you work in particular in these streets, you can not only solve your water problem, but these are also the spaces which in the, in the future may serve as typically parallel, by the way, to the larger roads like this. This one, I think it's Irak. Um, what's, what's the name? Irak? Yeah. Um, so we can come up with a structure which indeed helps us to solve these ecological problems, but also has a lot of social potential. And it's relatively small projects. You can multiply. It's not one big thing at one big crossroads but maybe in the end you uncover 30 of these creeks. And thank you, Spiro, for making this speculation about it, and I hope that with the students here in Athens, in the whole network which was built with the other universities in Greece and the colleagues, we can develop more of these speculative projects to find out whether a number of them really can be realized and can make the future of Athens better, as Tasso said before. And indeed, and this is my cliffhanger to you, actually, the idea of uncovering which, which is all, what is also already there comes from history. And I thought maybe it's good to conclude my, my presentation with some historic images. And this is maybe, this is one which was given to us by, uh, or which was handed over to us by um, Maria Yogopoulou of Gennadios Library. She said, hey, have a look in this scrapbook. Uh, maybe you can find something which is important for your studies. And we found these etchings from the, from the early 19th century. And on the right side of the image here, you can see the propylis. And then we're looking um, northwest uh, direction to, um, to um, Votanikos here hinten uh, in the back. And to be honest, this was a very, very interesting image for me. Not the ones of the Acropolis, which we have seen a hundred times, but this one because this one shows also a structure, a structure of how to treat the land, what the size of it is, what is the scale, where are the creeks? These are maybe the structures we need to find again. In the moment, maybe covered and to uncover them and to use also this very specific history to solve the specific challenges in Athens. I see a very, very big chance in there. And so we're zooming in in the images 
And when understanding what's happening here, that this is a way how to treat the landscape, to work with a natural situation here, to make it very, very space-specific and context-specific, you also understand that this is maybe a model which will, can help us to solve this situation. So this is my contribution for today. As always with the professors, I think too long. I hope not too boring and not too lengthy. And I hand over to Panayotis Tonikiotis. It's your stage, Panayotis. Thank you, Mark. Welcome to all of you, not only to Athens, but also to this gas storage balloon, which is uh, now a uh, Nodion storage room, an auditorium. Uh, it's the proof that uh, the city is in a transformational process. And thank you also, Mark, for the last picture uh, and covering the structure, the talents, the potentials of Athens and Attica. In a way, this could be a process of uncovering the past, but in my mind, it is also, and maybe much more, the process of uncovering the future. Today's symposium has the character of a review of many reflections and researches that have taken place in recent years between Athens and Munich through education, but above all, a fermentation for the formation of perspectives concerning the transformation of the Greek urban context. Indeed, the title of the book that will be presented to you shortly taking action, sums up more, most of what we have been discussing and much of what I would like to tell you today. We are used to, we are used in doing research and teaching at the university, doing research and making proposals to the relevant state bodies on their own initiative discussing all these at length in critical or consultative processes and doing very little, usually starting all over again, back to square one, as in the Jeva monopoly, again and again, endlessly. The issue of the transformation of the urban landscape of Athens has obviously been topical in our city for a long time, mainly as a negative criticism and as an immediate demand, without us always being fully aware of the corresponding problems and its treatments in other parallel cities. Yet, from a methodological point of view at least, this would be very interesting. And that's why parallel educational and research work in Athens and in Munich can have constructive results. Let me remind you that all cities like Munich and Athens do not seem to change, or at least they change slowly, but slowly enough to be cumulatively different after a few years. Living permanently in Athens it is difficult to see this continuum of change, either because it is too slow or because you digest every day and cannot easily perceive as a whole. However, looking at another city like Paris, where I go from time to time for short periods and always observe the urban landscape, the changes are many and significant, even though the city as a whole remains the same. Same happens in Barcelona with the mapping of thousands, hundreds of small changes. The longer durée 
can only be perceived when the mutations of the urban space are perceptually condensed in short time segments. This observation is important, at least from a methodological point of view, because the main issue that will concern us is to have a kind of long-term planning and to be able to implement it. In contrast, oh, sorry. In contrast to the taken for granted urban policy of integrated large-scale master plans which are considering everything and propose solutions to all kinds of urban issues to be implemented as soon as possible and as a whole. I'm trying to put together a planning strategy that will propose small and medium scale fragmentary interventions virtually interconnected and gradually implemented, allowing for adjustments, even reversals, depending on the actual course of things. The most important in Athens, which has, experienced a lot, which has experienced a long period of crisis, is that plans must be implemented. Returning to Paris, for which many radical projects in the past remained on paper and are now exhibited in museums, I can assure you that in the last few years, many, many small changes are constantly being made and cumulatively have the scale of the radical plans. The public space in central square, squares is increased. Cars are drastically restricted on historic avenues. Canals and docks are reclaimed Urban routes are repaired, pocket parks are created, and the porosity of the urban space is partially recovered. Bricolage, collage, agrafage are the words that come to my mind in front of this cosmogony. In addition, these words do not belong in the vocabulary of the well-educated architect and urban planner. In fact, bricolage literally means making or creating a useful and effective work from an assembly or adaptation of things that happen to be available and involves improvisation, but it is used as a concept with much broader meaning in the humanities. I'm especially referring to Claude Lévi-Strauss' Pensée Sauvage, The Wild Thinking, where he opposes the rational thinking of engineers, we are engineers in a way, to the cognitive processes that allow savage societies to recover and recombine the knowledge they already possess and reuse available materials to solve new problems. Similarly, collage, which refers to an avant-garde technique in the visual arts that combines separate pieces to create a new whole, is extended in the urban landscape to help shifting from the utopia of a single unique vision to a multi-faced and multilateral city form. Anyway, the complexity of urban form is a collage of continuities and discontinuities, combining differences in place history, traffic networks, urban fabrics, and social structures, including contradictions and similarities. The third term, agrafage, another French word, is literally a stapling of separate but similar elements that aim to reweave lost continuities. It refers to the stapling of disjointed urban continuities, usually disrupted after, after major infrastructure projects such as highways, interchanges, interchanges, or railways. 
prepare urbanity. In fact, I'm proposing a comprehensive but fragmentary and open planning at many scales and many levels involving interdisciplinary specialists and decision makers aiming at the feasible and the effective. I'm referring to the public space primarily and looking forward to an integrated series of many seemingly fragmented small and medium-sized interventions. This perspective is important for an additional reason. It does not include mutations of the urban environment that extend over a large area of space and last long enough to disrupt its unity and continuity. It further allows authorities, municipalities, and much more, dependent on desired cycles of political power, four years, five years, to complete their projects in a reasonable time and register the new projects in a distant continuity and or discontinuity from the old ones. This is not the peculiarity of the Greek political scene because it appears in a similar way in many small and large cities, although there are also several examples which are in the direction of a long-term integrated space management. It's not the case for Greece. However, it is very important that there can be continuity and change, that is a coherence, that includes contradiction and reversal. In order for this to happen, one of the conditions in the for, is the formation of an environment of shared and active understanding that extends from the space of professional education to the space of decision and implementation. The last finding, I'm following up what Mark was saying before, is a good reason to connect the university with the city. It's true that the educational process is and must be autonomous and independent to be able to innovate, challenge, and question at a distance from the established perception of decisions dependent on administration and economy. However, this dimension also produces a distance a potential, and potentially a gap that may prove unbridgeable. Not only because the educational process develops at a distance from the material reality, but also because this reality is not grafted with the research processes and experimentations which belong to the academic environment. The osmosis of concerns and practices will be mutually beneficial even as a means of understanding or measuring differences so that it should be programmatic for both sides. Of course, this should not be an established framework for cooperation, but a field for meeting and exchanging proposals, opinions, and methods that move in the same direction of the ever-changing city planning. In a way, this is what we are doing now by presenting you the results of an international cooperation of architectural schools that refers to a municipality and is implemented with the, co the cooperation of this municipality, namely Athens. On the other hand, the School of Architecture of the Technical University of Athens has a, lo a long tradition of undertaking research projects that respond to real problems of the urban environment and are prepared for public institutions with the ultimate goal of implementation in which postgraduate and doctoral students participate together with professors and researchers, some of them in the audience. A part of them has actually contributed to transform ideas and plans in the city making, and at the same time has fed the educational process with the necessary experience of real conditions. It has simultaneously shaped a number of young scholars with 
knowledge, methodology, and experience in taking action to transform urban landscapes. After all, today's students are the ones who will actually do it in the coming years. In this context, the collaboration with the School of Architecture of the Technical University of Munich, which has taken the initiative and was the driving force, as well the as the collaboration with the architectural schools of Thessaloniki, Patras, and Crete last year workshop, is not an ordinary educational collaboration, but a conscious intervention in the formulation of policies for the city addressed to its urban planning bodies, starting with the municipality of Athens. Thank you. Now the floor to Tassos Roidis, next generation. Thank you, Mr. Tournikiotis. Um, I will try to stay on time. Let's put it like this. But thank you for your um, nice presentations. I will also mean maybe you will listen some things double, but excuse us for this. We're all on the same boat here, so we exchange concepts. Eh? That, that's what we do. So hello again from my side. I will be giving a brief, brief, Review on the projects and collaborations we have worked on during our research and teaching project Inner Urban Landscapes of Athens, which officially as stated started in the end of 2020. When we talk about urban regeneration processes, especially in dense and saturated built environments, such as Athens, we say we often address the public space as the main sphere of potential change. But discussing about public space alone as the motor of urban regeneration, maybe doesn't help, as public space cannot be observed only as a singular element of the city. For example, here in this uh, picture on the left, you can see the, where public space ends and where private begins, at least in terms of ownership, where you see a small line and then how also the, the prokipio, the garden, I don't know how it's called in English, um, is being played out by the, by the locals. So public space is directly affected by the many private spheres that it is enclosed. Also, other than public spaces, spaces of public life extend well beyond the public realm into the thresholds of places that involve the exchange of goods, ideas, or services, and that facilitate the many private entities of the city. So we need to extend our field of view into these many privates that reflect their uses, densities, social and economic backgrounds into the public realm and formed our everyday city that interests all, today at least. At the Technical University of Munich, we have attempted to grasp the multiple spatial and social dimensions that we need to take into consideration when redesigning our cities by engaging with the research topic of the inner urban landscape. This concept or term aims at describing complex spatial and social relationships by referring to the places where public life takes place and the spatial elements within them, as well as the interdependencies that shape the way we live. Having that in mind, and with this extended field of view, we held our first design studio in Athens in 2019 at the area of Metaxurgio, which was a laboratory to explore the potentials and notions of inner urban landscapes in Athens. It soon became evident that investigating the public and private relations alone is not enough, as we have many typologies, many social problems, multiple elements that synthesize our everyday city. So when coming with our students to Athens, and we were welcomed by Panagiotis Turnikiotis, Christos Kritikos, um, and the NTUA, we opened up our view beyond the public spaces. We needed to address the stakeholders, as I said, involved in these transformation processes as the main actors of change. Also, we came up with typological differences, derelict buildings, and so on. So we tried somehow to create some conceptual analysis of how do this thing happen. So on the left, you can see, here on the bottom left, you can see a diagram of how different social territories interlap and maybe also create some 
problems or social uh, differences in, uh, in the area of Antaxurio. You see also here, for example, this zigzag line, which is uh, Iasono Street, which maybe all of, some of you know uh, what it refers to, and then how maybe the social mixture towards the south, let's say I think this is the south part, also gets a bit more mixed up. We're also investigating the potential of voids and how can we maybe bundle somehow voids together in the city, maybe also in a three-dimensional view. You see that in the model. This model shows actually in blue the non-used spaces in these areas. And then you see suddenly you have a new huge landscape and potentials which maybe in a synergy between the public and the private could um, lead to new solutions and new strategies. Similarly, we were also discussing about building typologies and how can we integrate maybe new typologies in the built space or how even uh, we can somehow create fields and spheres of, um, of, of influence in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the wider urban fabric. All this came together also in uh, one big model, so there were different th themes, different ideas that then also worked together and summed up their ideas in, uh, in one model. Pretty much the idea of summarizing smaller, um, smaller projects into a bigger strategy. So, then coming now to our Athens in urban landscapes projects, which actually came immediately after this studio, um, we thought that, um, that talking about, in order to explore and extend the multiple elements of these inner urban landscapes, we have started by setting up three working pillars, research, teaching, and collaborative outcomes. These three working pillars helped us accelerate our understanding for Athens and generate new research subjects. Based on that, we have sketched an outline of our research pro program. It's not so complicated. The pink is uh, the research. The middle one are the collaboration and the collaborative outcomes that we have done together with the NTUA. And the lower one are the academic exchange and the teaching that we're doing to our students. And all these crossing lines is how one informs the other throughout the whole process. So it's a cross-informing interdisciplinary process where research, teaching, and collaborations generate new topics and outcomes with the aim to generate and distribute knowledge. And knowledge here is depicted in yellow, so it grows and grows, not only among the the academic community, but also to the younger generation, the people who are interested in city processes. We'd like to thank again Panagiotis, Turnigiotis, and Christos Kritikos for collaborating with us throughout this project, and of course, John Xanthopoulos, Schwarz and the Schwarz Foundation for playing a catalytic role throughout the whole of this process. So, it was clear to us that we needed to start going to the researchers as well, and to the young people, as Mark said before. So we started by identifying a series of individuals who are actively involved in city making, architects and urbanists, professors and researchers, artists, and people from the administration. We've tried to establish links between them, depending on their field of knowledge and research. Some of you are here today, it's nice to see you all again. This attempt crystallized very quickly in an intensive round table day, which was developed around three key thematic subjects, publicness and livable neighborhood, Landscape and resources as common good, transformation and productive city. The goal of this round table was not only to discuss about current urban matters of Athens as a one-off event, let's say, but was rather to set up a work group, which would later develop to a core team for the book that we will present it to you later by my dear colleague Norbert Kling. Another goal was to identify a series of subjects which could then flow into our research and teaching methodology. At that point, we'd also like to thank Irini Kasiumi, who collaborated with us and co-moderated this uh, round table. So subjects discussed in this round table, together with new ones, were investigated through a series of research and mapping seminars, which were held at the same period at the Chair of Sustainable Urbanism at the TUM, at the master's level at the NTUA. The students had the opportunity to investigate aspects of inner urban landscapes, such as the stoas as a secondary urban network in the city, hello Spiro, the layering of history in the urban tissue, the appropriation of public space by private entities, typological codes of the city, the importance of urban networks, and new ways of mapping the city. 
Some of these contributions were documented in two magazines, which can also be found online on our chair's website. But we need to go from research back to design, because we shouldn't forget that our discipline is a design one. Focusing on research and interdisciplinary collaborations should actually help us design more informed and holistic urban environments, which is our goal as architects, and our landscape architects and urban planners, because everyone is represented here today, and this is something very nice also. In order to promote this culture of exchange between the students and the academic teachers, we've collaborated together with the NTUA and more Greek schools of, of architecture from Thessaloniki, Patras, and Chania, as Panagiotis Turnikiotis also mentioned before. We would, also, we would like to thank them all for participating in this intense weekly workshop. Together, we explored in a fast-track design workshop the potential transformation of six different sites in Athens' wider area, which are of great significance for the future of the city of Athens and tested different design scenarios. This workshop presented a set of radical ideas and keywords related to the urgent matters of urban transformation. In these complex urban situations, we have worked on investigating the multiple scales of the city, from the urban block and the neighborhood to the metropolitan scale, and by focusing on the generic elements of the urban tissue in order to be able to have a sense of transferability of the projects also in other locations. You saw this image also before. So at the same time, we supervised the master thesis on green urban transformation of Neon Iraklion, this northern suburb of Athens that Mark Michaeli also said some things before. Um, Spiros Kouloulis identified the revealing of the natural elements, and he also suggested on the left here this, um, this tool, these tools as a multiplicator factor again for the generic city. All these outcomes of the workshop, the master thesis, and the summary of the roundtable of December 2021 were presented also in an exhibition during um, which we also organized a public event at the NTUA with a panel discussion on the collaboration of academia, practice, and administration on the futures of Athens. We've also gained insight on other cities by inviting for a lecture Josep Bojigas and Ioana Spanou from the Barcelona Regional Agency. Mark Michelli said some things before, so I won't um, go into detail about it. Dissemination of knowledge and future perspectives. The Athens Inner Urban Landscapes, Landscapes project was and still is about exchanging what is unknown for us, because we also had a lot of unknown issues regarding Athens, through collaborating with our colleagues. During this three-year process, it became evident that in order to have more informed projects, we need a closer linking of students and academics with practicing professionals and individuals from the administration to exchange ideas and suggest solutions for the future of the city from their perspectives. This linking can happen in various ways, both short and long term. So we mentioned already research and teaching, conferences and public events like today, publications like the one you're going to see later or the magazines that we produce with our students, or long term collaboration schemes which could incorporate maybe all these things. So our proposal as the legacy of this diverse project is the creation of a group work a design laboratory or a think tank, we can call it as we like for the moment, for the metropolitan area of Athens, bringing together real projects and scenarios for possible future developments, bringing together municipalities, universities, professionals, and young talents. Such a scheme could co-create the future image of the city in a productive way by linking the, agen the agendas for future urban generation using the strategic goals of the government and the experience of professional, the research interest of the academics, and mainly the creative potential of the students and the young generation, as Mark said, to explore both long and short-term strategies for the metropolitan area. So for a sustainable green urban transformation, we need to consider the inner urban landscapes of Athens as a complex whole, which comprises of smaller and bigger correlated areas that form a new network from the iconic National Garden, which you can see here in the image. Here? Here. Right. To small pocket park interventions that are happening in the city of Athens at the moment. 
We need to work towards a continuity of projects for the establishment of a coherent metropolitan urban network. So let's hope that we can all together achieve that. I will now hand over to my colleague Norbert Kling, who will elaborate further on many of the mentioned subjects and will launch one of the major outcomes of this project, which is our book, Taking Action, Transforming Athens' Urban Landscapes. Thank you. Norbert? Thanks, Tassos. Welcome and um, good evening. My name is Norbert Kling. I'm a researcher at the Chair of Sustainable Urbanism. Thank you for being with us today. I have the honor to introduce the edited book, Taking Action, Transforming Athens' Urban Landscapes, whose publication we are also celebrating as part of this symposium tonight. Many of the authors and contributors are either here or attending online. Before giving a short insight into the book, I would like to thank all those who have made this publication possible. I do this on behalf of the editorial team. The generous support of the Schwarz Foundation helped us to organize a series of activities that were related to the book project. The milestones included the roundtable in December 2021 and a book workshop held at the National Technical University of Athens in May last year. We would also like to thank the National University of Athens for providing support and hosting these events. We are grateful to the team at Jovis for advising on matters related to the book production, for their patience, for coordinating the corrections, and for publishing this book with us. The printed book has been available since the beginning of this month. The ebook is now available as well. The book is written in English with Greek summaries. The tedious task of copy editing and translations was taken care of by a dedicated team of specialists. We would like to say thank you to all of them. The graphic designers Thorsten Köchlin and Joanna Katte developed the graphic concept and assembled the book. They took the notions of urban transformation, taking action and changing perception as starting points for their poetic and challenging image sequences. We think that they um, designed a great book and that the design adds very much to the special character. Many thanks to them also. Finally, a book has to be written. This edited book is the outcome of a collaborative research effort. We are deeply indebted to the authors for the commitment, interest, time, and effort which they put into all of this. On behalf of the editorial team, I would like to say that we really enjoyed the conversations we had while working with you together on this book. And it was a wonderful experience to see the book take shape with your work. Together with them, we hope that the book will contribute to the debates on urban landscapes in Athens and other cities. We hope that the book is inspiring and will be of interest to a diverse readership engaged with the making and remaking of cities. And we hope that it will support the urgently needed initiatives, be they big or small, of taking action towards positive urban change. We would like to Give a big applause to the people and institutions who have helped to make this publication possible. The focus of the book is on Athens. Like other cities in Europe and globally, Athens and its conurbation are challenged 
by a series of problems that demand far-reaching decisions and actions. Urban transformation is seen as an important lever to tackle some of the most pressing problems of the present. But we need the right instruments to successfully master the resulting challenges. We need to develop a full understanding of the conditions in which we operate and the potentials we have. We need strong and convincing narratives of change. The authors in this book engage with these fundamental issues. They come from different professional and academic backgrounds which are involved with the research, planning, or production of urban change. They have joined forces to reflect on the urban futures of Athens and inform ongoing debates. Hence, this edited volume combines scientific rigor with conceptual thinking, critical reflection with practical intervention. The chapters of this book are arranged around three thematic sections from which they relate to each other. In the following, I make use of these cross connections to emphasize the multiple perspectives offered by the book on the key topics. I will start with the last chapter in the book, which reflects on the struggles and successes of urban transformation in Barcelona. Last year, as Mark already pointed out, Josef Behigas and Johannes Banu visited the Antua to discuss Barcelona's ambitious long-term goals, which are based on the idea of placing people's everyday needs back into the center of decision-making. They applied an open and tactical kind of urbanism, and they moved forward according to opportunities and circumstances. The basic principles, we thought, could be relevant to Athens, even if we assume that every city is different and needs to find its own paths of change. The European perspective has also informed the conversation with Michaelis Goudis. It touches on core issues such as inclusion, forms of solidarity, experimentation and green transitions. How can these principles be successful, uh, successfully be applied within the reality of the urbanized Attica Basin. The Cultural Hydrant project demonstrates how this could be done. The project is centered around the co-managing of the water commons established by the ancient Hadrian's aqueduct. Irini Ilupulu and Vasilis Abdikos present this project as an innovative case of participation, empowerment, and cooperation between different departments and municipalities. Such multidimensional projects require innovative modes of mapping. Valina Yeropanta describes the analysis of a green public space in Kranja, which was conducted by students in close collaboration with the local communities. The study was sensitive to gender, issues and gave a voice to user groups that tend to be overheard in standard planning processes. A site glance to New York, New York gives us further ideas about activities in public space. Based on a study of streetscapes, Chris Schelling and Gitte Schroers propose a catalog of streetscape essentials that attract, enable, or even generate social interaction. In view of the difficulties we have, to, uh, we have with communicating change, artistic interventions offer interesting means through which tr transformation can be explored, appropriated, or contextualized, but also criticized and questioned. Theodora Malamou initialized and curated the project Athens Laundry Bugada, which engages with everyday practices. Its subtle yet powerful interventions demonstrate how art can create thought-provoking connections between the familiar and the unexpected, the private and the public. Taking Omonia Square 
As a point of uh, reference, Panos Trajonas shows how the media and digitalization have changed our relationship with public space. He argues that the design of public space remains an important task because it continues to accommodate and support a broad range of processes and actions. Similarly, Richard Wodic and Mark Kammerbauer reconfirm the potential of the specific public-private relationship that rests in the Greek polykatechia. At the same time, they emphasize that for various reasons, the era of the traditional polykatechia as the dominant building type has come to an end. These reflections show that public space and our ideas of publicness are not stable. If we assume that urban transformation is negotiated between public and private initiatives, we need to continuously review our ideas of this relationship. In this light, Tassos Redis defines and explores the concept of the inner urban landscape, which opens up new possibilities for the negotiation of differences and joint action. Christos Yorgos Kritikos sheds light on the complex relationship between private property and the right to urban heritage. The derelict neoclassical buildings in Athens show that well-intentioned legislation is not enough. Policies of change or preservation need to be coupled with the practical side of implementation. Thinking about sustainable urban transformation involves finding new ways to make the best use of the limited resources available in cities, be they heritage, spatial, environmental, or economic. This takes us to issues of governance and the complex interplay between spatial and other processes. Raising the fundamental question of who we are planning for, Konstantina Yoriadu discusses past and more recent situations of crisis related to migration and the different strategies devised by the city and society at large in response to these challenges. Institutional arrangements and the specific specifics of the Athenian planning culture are also in the focus of Dimitris Poulios. He discusses the enabling as well inhibiting effects of the centralized Greek planning system. As the chapter by Elisabeth Barignani and Grammatiki Papasoglu demonstrates, the city of Athens has initiated an ambitious program of urban restructuring to make the city more resilient and responsive to climate change. They conclude by considering how higher levels of integration could be achieved through a landscape-led approach. Fundamental changes need inspiring narratives through which they become tangible. In my contribution to the book, I take the Mount Metos reafforestation project as an example of a process in which the commitment to a shared vision, civic engagement, local knowledge, and joint action has produced a complex urban ecology from which many Athenians can benefit today. The ecological perspective and the emphasis on long-term strategies that are not compromised by a politics of austerity are also central to John Goodman's chapter. He stresses the need for a better understanding of the relationship between human actions and the environment. Mark Micheli addresses the question of how to develop processes that are capable of shaping the fundamental changes that are underway. Combining insights from governance, transformation design, and examples from urban practice, he argues for the integration of public and private initiatives and for open yet goal-oriented modes of transformation. He refers to this concept as the thousand green deals. From this proposal, we can linked to Panayotis Tonikiotis' reflection on continuity and change. 
In view of the complex tasks ahead, he stresses the need to connect academic research and education with the processes of and in the city. He reminds us that the current generation of students will be challenged by the problems we have created in the past and that they are among the main actors of urban transformation in the coming years. This brings us back to the main intention of the book and its title. Taking action, transforming Athens' urban landscapes is an invitation to comprehend and learn from the Athenian condition, but also to actively participate in and contribute to the city's multiple transformations. So we hope that the short journey through the book has also activated your interest in the book. We have set up a stand just outside of this um, space and uh, you're kindly invited to look inside and flip through the book and uh, there is also a QR code that takes you to the publisher's website where you can pur uh, purchase the book. We will now have a break. We are uh, a little bit running late. I'm looking over to, to Mark. Maybe we start at 10 past 7. Um, and um, after the break, Regina Keller will show us in her keynote how landscape design can support processes of informa uh, trans urban transformation. So thank you very much. Enjoy the break and see you in a minute. Thank you, Norbert. Uh, yeah, let's say 10 minutes break uh, so that we keep track on time because uh, it's the longest day of the year and it will be night until we're done from here. So 10 minutes break huh? and you can take a look at the book. Okay.
seats again. Okay, so I hope that you enjoyed the first part, so which was actually the pre-event. Now we're coming to the main event. The main event where we'll discuss uh, in what way we can activate all this knowledge produced by these numerous scientists, students, um, contributors in the project. And we thought that it would be good to invite somebody who did it did it um, activating this new knowledge because she is uh, somebody who is professor at the university, very strong in research on public space, Regine Keller, landscape architect from Technical University of Munich, the chair of uh, landscape architecture and public space. She worked with students on a lot of projects in different cities, also in Athens, which I learned. Um, um, but she's also practicing in an office in a very successful, on a regional but also international scale, Uniola. I, I should not say it wrong, but it's always very tricky with these uh, abbreviations. Um, and she's also, I think, very good in, in really understanding these processes of governance. And this you can see from the fact that the, she is the department. Uh, department head of the Department of Architecture in our School of, uh, of Engineering and Design, and I can tell you it's not so simple to run such a business like being a department head. So I'm very happy that you could make it to, um, to Essence. It was kind of tricky yesterday with the Lufthansa, but today we managed to get you here to Essence, and I'm very curious what you have to tell us. Regina, I leave you the stage, but I have to say first that we want to reflect on what Regina says and invited three really strong ladies to the panel, which is Elisabeth Bajani. You already heard from her. She is from the city of Athens, the chief heat and resilience officer of the city of Athens, so she can maybe reflect on the governance perspective, then Panita Karamanea, landscape architect as well. In the future, I hope that the administrative project process will run a little bit faster. We are all waiting for it. Um, professor at uh, NTUA, but in the moment, a professor of landscape architecture in at the Technical University in Crete, and also practicing landscape architect with very beautiful uh, designs, which we can see from competition success. And then Evie Nanopoulou, um, great engineer architecture in a very, very um, important uh, company here. So she's representing the industry of planning, of making things happening in real world. And Evie, I'm very happy that you're here and from your long experience also can reflect on what Regine is saying and telling us how we can activate this knowledge. Regine. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, and thank you very much for <clears throat> giving me the honor to speak to you tonight and inviting me to this um, tremendously great um, event tonight. Um, I'm really happy to be back in Athens. Uh, I'm really happy to see some familiar faces like Panayotis Tunikiotis, and uh, I'm happy to meet Mrs. Schwartz, uh, which is really nice to see someone who uh, supports the whole um, event. And we all know that um, research only happens if we have support. Yeah? It's not only the 
a state who um, supports us, but private uh, supporters as well. So thank you for um, making this event possible today. Um, I brought you several pictures tonight, and I will rush through very many pictures, and we heard already a lot about transformatory processes in cities, especially in Athens. So I will not really pick out Athens as a topic from my point of view, but I will compare some things. And as we heard all the things today and all the hopeful things which are somehow written in that new book, which I really admire, I had the possibility to have a little glance into it and it's really a great work and it really shows how much already has been achieved. So it's not only stating that there are problems, it shows that there are very many planning processes on the run and are worth following it to be followed up. So please buy this book and you will be very much informed and hopefully very much inspired. But um, what we share is we are all in a huge concern about our European cities. This is the reason why we look so thoroughly on these cities. And I always keep asking myself, how did we get there? How did we get to that stage of today where we, well, mourn about more or less the idea of modernity? More or less, very many cities in Europe are very much influenced about the idea of modernity due to very many reasons. Some reasons of these transformations bringing cities into that modernist transformation had been driven politically, economically, or had been driven by territorial ideas and had been driven by very many effects of World War II in Europe as well. So we are somehow um, today confronted with results of the modernistic ideas which had been raised in the 1920s and written down, for example, in the Charta uh, of Athens in the 1940s and very often had been transformed after World War II when very many places had been totally destroyed and very many cities took the opportunity not to rebuild cities on their old footprint, but to change the city fabric absolutely in a, in a vast, um, let's say, urbanistic experiment as well. So housing, ideas of mobility, ideas of industry followed the ideas of trans transforming very many cities in the 1950s in that what we face until today. Cities which are somehow intrigued by the idea mainly of economy and mobility. We have some icons, architectural icons out of that time. So in our cultural heritage, the modernity takes a huge part. And Athens, for example, is full of these examples of modernity in a very positive way on the one hand side. But on the other hand side, the city fabric the urban structure is very much influenced, especially by very many um, ideas of mobility as well as of um, the idea of building construction. So this is not only essence which is facing that problem, but this drives us to the idea, do we have to change something? And sure, very many of our projects nowadays are driven by the idea that the result of the modernity and the result of the last 70 years after World War II in very many European cities is not satisfying and to us. To that problem we face today, the problems of climate change, which is probably very densely connected to that what we did during the last 70 years, densifying cities, and contemporary cities are very uh, much uh, the result of densification as soon as they are agglomerations which are huge and which have a huge driving factor for people to join these cities and to migrate into these cities. So Athens is one of these um, examples. And when we talked for our uh, conference today, before we all considered that we all 
somehow fear a loss of identity of these European cities due to the fact of densification. So where are we now? now? How can we really rethink European cities which have a strong history? Panayotis Tonikiotis told us about the historical background of very many European cities, but somehow are overwhelmed by the constructions and the ideas of modernity. And very often it's really hard to tell where we are, because if we compare the aerial photos of very many cities, it's really difficult to tell where are you now? Yeah? Where are we looking at? The problems are similar. Probably to some of you, this city aerial photo is really easy to um, know because there is the Theresienwiese, the uh, very famous uh, ground, playground, I would like to say, for the Oktoberfest on the uh, eastern part of that photo. So we face similar pro projects and similar um, phenomena. And probably I would like to add to the urgencies in Europe we face the urgency on how we deal with our today's structures and especially with our infrastructures probably are the key points of our environmental and our urban transformation we can achieve. So changing the ideas on how mobility functions in cities, how it's somehow working together and what kind of area it occupies and where it leads to, very often to the fringes of the city where the people would like to live in a green surrounding area in their own little house, produces not only pictures and images, as you said, um, Mark, it produces somehow, I would like to call it nightmares as well. So is this the result of modernity? Is this the result of making equal rights for everybody to have the same conditions for living? Yes, on one hand side, yes, it was one of the huge aims of the Charta of Athens um, to achieve equal possibilities for everyone. But if the equality looks like this, I think we should have to rethink it. The scale of the city plays a role. And if we compare some of the cities we today had been already mentioning, like Paris, Athens, oh, this is covered, Berlin and Munich, we see that the density looks very similar to us on the uh, figure ground plan. But if we go deeper into the facts and figures, we know it's totally different. If we compare, for example, Paris with its center it, on, a, on an area of 105 square kilometers to Athens, where we have 412 square kilometers, um, Athens looks, looks much um, larger, but in the end, it's the same amount of people living in a much smaller area in Paris. So the density in Paris is tremendous. Again, another comparison. Berlin, the area is, the square meters are 891 square meters compared to Munich, which is 310 uh, kilometers per square, um, and we have uh, 4,800 persons per square kilometer. So the density is similar, to, similar but the um, perimeter is totally different. So does size really matter? The size of the city itself, I would say, no, it doesn't matter. But the density matters. The density matters because it shows us the conditions we saw in these aerial photos, that there is hardly any space left, any urban free space left, and everything is under construction. So how can we understand this mechanism? How did we come so far? How did we reach these um, points? And how can we solve that? And I'm questioning myself, who are the stakeholders in city development? What are the driving forces of the city development? You might easily answer that, but if we confront ourselves uh, with a wide range of the stakeholders, we know how complex it is to bring these stakeholders together. 
It's politics, it's politicians, it's the building industry, it's the planning administration, it's the citizens, and it's the academia. And besides building industry and planning administration, I should probably mention private investors, investments as well, who own a lot of these parts of a city. An interesting thing to me was a survey which was made by an international real estate investment management, a company who did a study among 130 European cities to find out the 10 most dynamic cities. The study was made in 2019. And the most dynamic cities are Stockholm, Basel, Oxford, Munich, Dublin, Berlin, Amsterdam, Paris, Cambridge, and London. But what had been the criteria to judge so, to, to assume that these are the most dynamic cities? And the key criteria had been the plenty of culture, the amount of green spaces, the presence of companies that drive innovation, the presence of research, of universities and startups, and in addition, museums, theaters, and for all the people who are streaming tonight, mobile and broadband network who interconnects cities with their surrounding areas. So all the things I mentioned might fit to Athens, wouldn't it? So probably it's still a lack of green spaces which is missing to accomplish and to finalize the picture, so to join the 10 most dynamic cities for Athens as well. But how do we actively transform urban landscapes? How can we achieve, achieve that? And again, in our discussion before we uh, spoke about the um, conference, we thought, yes, we need good practice examples. We need examples who show us that there is a potential, and if the potential of a space is found, how can it be changed? And i just like to um, give you this example of Atelier Le Balto, um, who is, has um, their practice in Berlin, to show how very many places which seem to be lost as an urban landscape, as a potential space for green spaces, could be changed only by planting plants and taking care for them. And I think these gardeners, Atelier Le Balto are not landscape architects, but practical gardeners. They plan these examples themselves and they bring these examples into uh, the community to make an example how you can somehow transform urban lost places. But before we find these places, we have to understand the city and we have to understand the urban landscape to understand the history, the topography, and the fabric of the city as a potential for a local identity. And somehow we have some similar slides tonight. I'd like to show again Athens, and I'd like to show the topography of Athens in the past. Um, and it's really interesting, these drawings, um, this cartography, and especially the drawings from uh, Mr. Stademann are so precious to show us where the landscape is and where it was. And um, yeah, we can probably derive from these uh, poetical um, drawings which had been reality, the idea on how what, the layer which is underneath the fabric which you already mentioned in your uh, mentionings in your um, book. So I would like to invite you to read the landscape of a city, and it could be one method to understand a city and to recover a landscape of a city. Because I think landscape plays a key role in the urban change, as already been mentioned. Besides the academic approach that we have to do a lot of research about uh, urban strategies, um, there is a municipal um, uh, approach, and I'd like to point out one plan which we already saw today as well. Because we are quite sure that cities need an overall strategy. And we have famous examples tonight. Paris is mentioned 
uh, for several times tonight. And in 2007 until 2009, the city decided to make a competition amongst a lot of, of 10 architectural offices to um, make a request for an overall strategy which had different layers, mobility, uh, green planning, spatial planning, infrastructure, and uh, the results had been quite striking. But in the end, these results are somehow a transport for a process which then goes into an administrative, in an, into a municipal and planning department's process. So the outcome are these plans which had been mentioned by Mark Michaeli as well. Major projects for a region which somehow interlink the city with its region and interlinks the city with its own fabric and showing the capacities of different um, spots in the city. I would not like to emphasize on this because Mark Michaeli already mentioned it and showed it even more in the depths on how precise Paris, Paris worked about a special um, urban spaces to develop a transformation of the city. So this is really a need what a, a, a city really um, has to fulfill in the end to make an overall strategic plan. And another thing we already saw today, and as far as I know, Katja Strohecker will emphasize on this tomorrow as well for in her uh, lecture, the city of Munich did the same, and the identification of the landscape, the inner city landscape, is one driving factor to connect areas, to connect city quarters within uh, the city fabric through the idea of landscape. Existing landscapes, like a riverbed of the River Isar in Munich, but other landscapes which are still not connected yet but historical parks, for example, connected with newer parks. So the green structure plays a crucial role in that step 2040. It's a development program until, uh, projected until 2040. And as well, uh, on different layers, there are different addresses like um, the interconnection between the outer villages and the inner city and uh, the whole plan as already shown. And an extra plan, which is called Munich Open Space 2030, which is an extra uh, idea of how open space could um, be transferred into an interconnecting uh, system, a system which provides alleys, avenues, uh, boulevards, parks, and is a uh, a key factor for a walkable city and a city which is not only there for cars and mobility but another kind of mobility for pedestrians and bike drivers. So I think these two um, strategies are really, really important and the interesting thing is that not only the planning department together with scientists and uh, private uh, planning offices developed this planning, they handed it over to the city government and the city government made decisions on how to implement these areas in the city into a, a next step, which will be shown again from Katja Strohecka tomorrow, where you go deeper into the details and point out several um, nature-based solutions, for example. On the local scale, I would like to show another strategy, the strategy on getting aware of landscapes which, due to the idea of modernity as well, seem to be lost, like our city river Isa, which was embanked in a, in a bed which was um, full of cobblestones and concrete and was in a strict uh, line through the city and there was the idea of renaturing uh, the river in the inner city um, district. There was a competition held for that uh, renaturing of the River Isar with the idea to have more wilderness, to have more open banks and to approach the, uh, the river as an uh, environment which is not only there to um, provide energy in one case but to provide um, areas for leisure and pleasure. And it was built. 
it was built through several years, and you can not imagine how much things has to, had to be built underground to make this river, which is a wild river, which is a tamed river from the Alps, from the Alpine mountains, to make it possible that this riverbank of the left-hand side looks like the river on the right-hand side nowadays. And it's a regaining landscape project, uh, a project which not only brings back spaces for people, but a multi-species approach, spaces for animals and wildlife as well. And I think this is really um, striking. Even so, it's monitored by biologists and it has a lot of problems because the Munich people love that river so much that there is a high uh, density of people during the summer months. Now it will be crowded on a day like this and um, the wildlife struggles a bit with uh, all these citizens uh, taking a bath in the River Isar. But this is the only water feature we have. We do not have a seaside in Munich. But you can imagine, it's fun there, swimming in the untamed river Isar. I just wanted to show a picture of Kifisos. I really like that river and its history. Could be untamed probably one day. Yeah, it had a history and probably it has earned a new history in the future. Academic approach, and I come to the uh, transformation of cities, the public space. Mark Michaeli was mentioning that we did research on um, public spaces in Munich. We called the project 100 Places M. And uh, we had been funded by the environmental ministry, the Bavarian environmental ministry, uh, for that project for three years. And we did research about 100 places. And you see the city map of Munich, how we try to spread all these uh, um, case studies over the whole city fabric and how we tried to collect data. And we did so. We collected data through geographical information systems, but through mapping systems as well. We collected it on site uh, with students and with research assistants. We had been drawing maps and we had been delivering maps of each of these 100 places to um, really build up a very, very dense information base. Each uh, place was overviewed with a request uh, or um, a mapping sheet which asked for 400 different items, from benches to uh, waste bins to uh, the existence of birds or the kind of trees. So we were quite busy to collect all the data of these 100 places. But what do you do, do we do with all this data? We anyhow have too many data in very many cases. We use this data to um, sort out which places have a high potential to be changed. Um, we counted the amount of um, sealed surface and we looked for places who had the capacity to be unsealed and places who had the capacity to plant more trees because one driving factor for the research for these 100 places was uh, to find out how can we meet the problems of the heat island effect in inner cities and what could we do to mitigate that. So we needed some case studies where we got more into detail, but on the other hand, we worked together with anthropologists and they told us, you will not do that without citizens. So we had been choosing out of these 100 examples, 10 examples where we made case studies with a real-life laboratory outdoors. And one of these laboratories was the Piazza Zinetti. Zinetti Platz, um, we did the same research and did the documenting, and we initiated a first phase of participation and part a participatory project in that space. This is the human scale when you look at it and it was very much dominated by parking cars, a very tiny place, a lot of housing next to it, but a lack of public space for the people living there. Yeah? A lot of high rise, uh, uh, not high rises, but, but condominiums and uh, housing areas which are very compacted with a lot of uh, a lack of public and uh, private green spaces. 
So the interaction with the, um, with the community was to prepare that place as a place where something should happen, to make, to build up an awareness with the citizens nearby. So my research assistant went out and marked the place as a place where something would happen. We called it circling the square, to get next to it and to make an awareness process. Then we invited the citizens for a workshop uh, on site where we discussed uh, nearby how we could change that place and how the citizens somehow judged the idea on um, changing this place at all. And the first phase was only to build three things. One wall, you see it in the background, and two stages. The wall one should have been the idea of a wallpaper wall, uh, an idea where all the news could be spread and put down. It had a little cupboard in there where you could uh, lend books. And the two stages were the experimental areas where we wanted to wait what should, would happen. Again, before and after. The first decision of the citizen was the color of the walls are ugly. We don't like this magenta color. It looks like Telecom, which is a, a provider for mobile phones, and they didn't like it, and they thought, no, we have a, make a decision, and they made the decision, we want it green. So the citizens painted the walls green. Then they decided, uh, we have to put in life into that little space. And uh, the first initiative was to roll out uh, a lawn and to play uh, tennis on that lawn. It was during... Corona. In the Corona and COVID uh, times, it was very necessary to have space in the public space because you couldn't meet in dense situations. So the public space really gained a lot of meaning to all the citizens. One of the events which happened on the stage on the left hand side was that the barber from the barbershop next there put his chair on the platform and then um, asked people to come to get their beard shaved or their hair cut. So very many things happened very, very frequently and very, very often. Or the children decided they wanted to have a swimming pool, so a swimming pool was installed. In the end, before, on the left-hand side and after, the initiative itself took a stage which uh, led the people to the decision, we want this now since, I think, four years almost now. And the decision was made that the city of Munich decided the cars will stay out there. So, decision-making processes are sometimes things which are driven by experiments in public spaces. And I can only encourage everyone who wants to change something to risk experiments in public space because they are really making sense. Not only done by famous architects like Giel Architects, Times Square, um, in other big cities, but I think very small, tiny city squares uh, could really achieve the same. So my last sentences would be, not only make grey and green infrastructures visible, but also invite their users to turn to them and take responsibility. It's important to plan public spaces not only as infrastructures that make certain uses possible, but also as unfinished landscapes and prototypes that require the continuous participation and commitment to the users. And the last sentence, it's important to recognize that the design skills of users in adapting to the consequences of climate change or the urban heat island and to integrate them into the square concepts and designs is really urgent. So these are other urgencies we are facing and I hope this inspires you. I think there is a need for an urban landscape agenda for Athens. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot, Regine. Um, now, how it 
how it goes on now. Um, we, we asked three persons from, uh, from Essence, as I introduced before, um, um, to reflect to what Regina said. Um, in particular, all these elements you propose, like, for example, doing experiments, having developing a very different view on, on landscape, etc. So if you'd like to, you can take seat here or in the first row. And I ask Elisabeth Bajani, who's representing the city of Essence first, to, to give us some reflection on what Regina said. Do you want to speak from here? Because we need the mic. Oh, we have a mic? Oh, you have a mic up there. Okay. Okay. So. Thank you. That was excellent. I really enjoyed your um, presentation, and I think there are a lot of things that um, uh, could be taught in our case. Um, and it's very important to see how processes are fitting together or don't fit together sometimes. So I really like the fact uh, regarding the strategies that you mentioned, the open space strategy and uh, the S, the step strategy for 2040 that you've done for uh, Munich. I think this unifies and has a more landscape-led approach for, the, for Munich. And um, it could fit uh, all strategies together for the city of uh, Munich and in, case, in our case for the city of Athens in one public open space plan. And I think we do a lot of things in the city of Athens and we do a lot of strategic plans also like sustainable urban mobility plans. Uh, we've recently issued our climate action plan, which is very uh, landscape-led. The goals for the plan are quite ambitious, increasing 30% of the green spaces of Athens and having a 15-minute walk from, uh, from, <clears throat> from uh, a, a, a green space for, uh, with ecosystemic services from home. So that's really uh, quite something. Um, so, if we put all the strategies together that we are doing and we map these kind of uh, projects uh, for each case, that would be something that um, uh, it could be excellent to, to follow up. Um, you talked at the, be the very beginning, you talked about the topography of the city and that's something to understand very clearly. And I think the topography of Athens, especially at the beginning of the 50s, 60s, uh, is what uh, actually saved the green spaces in the city of Athens. Because at the moment, yes, because all the hills that we've got, uh, they, they are the big lungs uh, for the green spaces of the city. And we, this is the, the, the basic, that's the bones, for actually making a, a landscape-led uh, plan. And we are doing that right now. Uh, the big plan has to do with creating green corridors inside the city. Uh, well, hmm? It's okay. Well, well this is... Uh, um, this has to do with what uh, the goals for the city of Athens has set up uh, regarding the climate action plan. And there are also opportunities for the city and also funding opportunities from the participation through European programs and also through uh, the, the mission, the EU mission, um, which aims and targets for uh, carbon neutrality till 2030, which is a great mitigation uh, goal. Uh, that really needs to adapt to, meet to adaptation goals and um, be linked together with uh, uh, greening the city, how this could be combined. Um, and also, um, we try to create some uh, tools in the city of Athens on how to actually go about seeing the landscape, the public space, uh, through uh, climate change. So a program that we use in Reach Out, for example, uh, we try to make climate resilience tool, tools, creating cli the climate story for Athens, which gives the vision in public spaces as well, apart from other things. 
uh, and also uh, create tools on how to design these public spaces, which is really important. Oops. Down. Down. Uh, well, here we've uh, overlaid um, the green spaces of the city of Athens and the three avenues of the city of Athens. So if you look at this big map at the, at the right that I see it, uh, Athens looks quite green like that. <laughs> so the, 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 the value of the three avenues of the city is huge for the microenvironment of the city of Athens. And that's an asset that uh, uh, we want to keep to enhance and build on in, other to, in order to connect to our big green spaces and make this kind of open plan that you show for, for Munich. That's really amazing. Uh, on the, the small map, um, it's, um, it's a research that uh, we've done in three consecutive years for the city of Athens, three summers, and we have the mean, te mean land surf surface temperatures. So you see the hot spots for the city of Athens. The red one uh, is the area of Eleonas, where big, the big parks are going to happen, like the vice mayor said earlier. And I'm proud to say that the, the coolest spot in Athens is the National Garden, if you see it over there in the middle, this park. And this is explained because it, is, uh, it has a lot of water there, and it has a lot of dense and... Uh, dense vegetation and a lot of biodiversity. So, uh, but this is not just to say which is the hot spot and which is the cool spot. This is, this is to explain uh, and to make policies on data. To have uh, data-driven policies in the city. And actually, at some point, we would need to zoom out, to zoom in into each um, block into each building block in the city of Athens and uh, see the inner uh, urban landscape go into a smaller scale on that. Uh, previously, unfortunately, my colleague from the urban planning department uh, couldn't stay any longer, but she, uh, she's, she has prepared with her team the urban planning strategy for the West Attica, which is going to be announced quite soon. And that's a that's a huge thing uh, for the city of Athens, uh, especially for the West area and the Academia Platonos, which is an area that is vulnerable to heat, and it has a lot of legislation and um, process issues in the past. So slowly, slowly, building on this data and trying to sol solve the, um, uh, the permissions, the bureaucracy, and the collaborations between authorities is something that is proceeding. At in this point, I would like to say that um, in, uh, in every city in the world that we've studied, and especially in Athens, we have the data on the front page, on the, front, uh, on the top bit, uh, we see that most uh, the hottest areas are the ones who lack green spaces, and they coincide completely with the areas that most vul socially vulnerable and f uh, poorer people live. So that's um, it's, uh, because, Michael, you did, you did talk about uh, green and just recovery. So um, it's very, very important. It's, it's an equity thing that does regard with climate and heat. And some inspiration from us. About, I talked to you about the, um, the green uh, routes, the green corridors that we do. Uh, very landscape approach project. We're very proud of it. Um, we are studying three areas uh, in the city of Athens, in three neighborhoods, in Labrini Exarchia and in Plato's Academy, uh, using nature-based solutions, solving the issue on mobility, because as you did talk, mobility is a huge issue, and car parking and the use of cars is something that, uh, not only in Athens, because a lot of Greeks believe that it's just an Athenian thing, the car. It's, it has to do with many, many cities. Um, make the traffic arrangements in order to create more uh, active mobility into these neighborhoods. Uh, and also the Elkabitus Hill that has to do with the uh, soil erosion issues and the vice mayor earlier described the project. So I don't want to waste any more of your time, but I can talk a little bit if there's any questions later.
come here. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. I'm very happy to be here. I would like to congratulate uh, the initiative of the two schools, of Munich and of Athens, uh, for this um, initiative to talk on uh, the future of the city that got embraced also from uh, the Schwarz Foundation. And I, would, I was asked to um, very briefly uh, think and um, tell you three key points. I would start from that, Mark, no? On uh, what should happen uh, in Athens in order to rethink and to uh, make better the situations. So I think we're on the same page from what I've seen today with Regine, with Elisabeth, and with uh, Mark. And uh, I will just very quickly um, explain who I am. I'm Parin Takaramane. I'm an architect and a landscape architect. I teach these topics and I work on them uh, in the professional world through projects and competitions. And um, first of all, the first key point, very quickly, uh, for me too, would be to uh, bring in the front the natural landscape of Athens. Athens seems to be a city that has forgotten or has hidden her natural landscape. The Attic landscape, which has been praised and uh, influenced and inspired the West intellectuals, especially after a little bit before and after the uh, revolution of, and the inauguration of the new state. A landscape that has been painted. There are a lot of things written on it since the antiquity, of course. And that has uh, a strong genius Loki that it's kind of hidden. It's as if the city has turned the, its back to the natural landscape since the 50s, after the war. So it has been mapped and painted, as you see in old paintings, and as we saw today also in gravures from the Gennadius uh, uh, Library. A lot of uh, inspired architects have sketched it and have been uh, Desi they designed through it, but today it's covered and it's a, in a way abandoned and the city is being functioning in another way. So we have to rethink and understand again, or try to understand anyway, the morphological aspect of this landscape. It's a, it's a series of hills, a series of streams Green areas that they exist, but they are fragmented and they're like islands in between the rest of the city, the network of the city. There are green areas in Athens, but they're not interconnected. And of course, the big privilege that this city has, the coastal zone, a coastal zone that from Faliro to Sunia is almost 50 kilometers with a lot of different um, small relationships that there are a variety of different types and identities of relationships of the city with the sea. And it's as if this is totally in another uh, condition that has nothing to do with the introverted city, the way the city is today functioning. So through this understanding, the interological and ecological functions should be incorporated in the design approach, intensify the porosity and of course, insert bioclimatic aspects, resiliency and sustainability. So bring in front again the Attic landscape as a cultural identity, a cultural heritage also of the city that gave birth to the culture and that has been uh, praised, but now it's covered, forgotten, it's in a nub almost condition. So first of all this, then understand that the city is a totality. We are talking about a system of public spaces of different scales and densities, but a system. So we have to have a big picture, a flexible maybe big picture. We have to have a structural way of thinking the city, of all this system of streams, of, of hills, of greens, of uh, pedestrian connections, of squares, 
but there are potentialities in every corner, so we have to have a big picture, but that could be realized through the small scale, but not a fragmented small scale, not fragmented projects that are like small islands, but projects that are in coordination as an interconnected network, structural network of elements. And of course, augment walkability. And then the last key point, I think, is continuity. Continuity, first of all, in mentality, to find a common ground of an integrated approach in the short and the long term, in strategies, in planning, in actions, in processes, but in collaboration of the administration, the university, and the professional practice, in order to have interdisciplinary teams that work together for a complementary approach. I believe we have to be together in this effort and, of course, incorporate the, pro the people in the process too. But to have continuity in decisions and in the long-term uh, approach, not change uh, the beliefs every two, three, five, or four years. We've seen today Paris, 250, 240, Munich, 240, that have a, a long-term span, time span of uh, approaches and processes. So these are the briefly three key points. Yeah, the three key points, and in the end, you already come back to this kind of social aspect. Of yes. The Yes, thank you for the invitation. And uh, more than that, I would like to congratulate the whole team, and especially uh, Mrs. Kranthopoulou and uh, uh, Schwartz Foundation for the whole initiative and for the funding, but uh, as well all of you for your commitment to contribute exceptionally to this dialogue around the current issues affecting the future of our city's public space and consequently on critical issues related to our quality and future of our lives. Um, as a, a company that has worked for many, many years in this city and uh, in all scales and uh, fields of, of spatial planning and uh, design, we would like to add to this discussion three ideas that may be of some value, complementary to what was presented up to now, with the hope that this may mobilize more people and activate some common initiatives. This is the purpose of this meeting, I suppose. Uh, the first, that's it. The first initiative seeks, seeks to build on the uniqueness of the city, which is the heritage and the landscape. It concerns the vision of making the city of Athens a continuous cultural grove that will reveal and highlights its identity and historic evolution instead of a fragmented, as Panita said, city, we will propose a holistic city conceived as a cultural grove that will ensure coherence and continuity. The long durée that Mr. Tunicotis mentioned, continuity between archeological sites, public spaces and parks and hills and sea, continuity of space and time that will reflect the spirit of the, sp of the place, its intangible anthropocentric heritage. The two recent 
projects of Botanicos and Plato's Academy that the municipality of Athens is developing today may act as a catalyst towards this proposed transformation, unification, and add to the collective memory of the city. Uh, we have some other examples that may add to this discussion if there is time to do so. The second initiative, the second initiative is related to the sea and seeks to build on the very special relationship of Athens with the sea, a relationship that must be reinforced as it is the city's biggest and most natural park in parallel, a relationship that should be highlighted as historically the city draws its strength from the sea, we believe that a visionary plan for the Attic coast should be developed. And if, you, if we look at uh, Athens, we should look at the Athens uh, uh, as a metropolis. Uh, the Attic coast consists a palimpsest of different natural and cultural landscapes that shape the physiognomy and the identity of the broader city. Here you can see an interesting landscape analysis that shows the difference in character between the two parts of the coast more urban in the, in the north and more natural in the south, something that should be, in, in any case, maintained in, at any cost. There is an urgency to work and agree in an integrated strategy of the coastal zone of Athens in order to handle in a holistic way critical issues related to climate change, environmental degradation and coastal erosion, natural based solution and sustainability, mobility and connectivity of urban tissue, landscape control of users to create implementarities and prevent discontinuities. It is unbelievable that we look at separate developments today without conceiving, without having a coherent strategic plan on the coastal zone. I hope you agree that we should start looking at a broader image of the Athens metropolis and at the challenge it offers in order to enhance and protect and, prom and promote the natural and cultural wealth of the city and, add, uh, and uh, bring an added value to it. The third um, the third idea is related to uh, a common urban planning strategy. We have seen that uh, uh, it is important to have a common urban planning strategy and adoption of new European Bauhaus principles in regeneration projects like that that the municipality is today handling, for instance, the metro station squares. It is very important, in, my, in our opinion, to see these metro station squares not as squares, but as nodes, nodes to a system and not specific, just squares. So um, today, the, the periphery of Athens is working with Jasper's consultants of DG Regio to introduce the new European Bauhaus guidelines in the Phileron Regeneration Project. This is a project in which we were involved from, uh, from the Olympic uh, period. The Phileron Regeneration Project uh, is introducing new European Bauhaus guidelines uh, and create uh, and probably will be a flagship for, of the new initiative. This is a project that aims to restore the landscape of Attica, the connection of the uh, city with the sea by creating a unique continuous physical and cultural destination that will bridge Athens to Piraeus, 
a public space of high quality addressed to citizens and visitors. The challenge is not to take steps back and reconsider the master plan and the design of the park that has been ratified since 2013, but to enrich them in order to align with the principles of the new European Bauhaus and reflect its values. The values of sustainability related to climate change mitigation and adaptation, circularity, protection and enhancement of biodiversity, change of social habits. The value of beauty related to integration to natural and cultural context, inclusiveness and innovation. Finally, the value of being together related to physical and social access, as well as to activities, complementarity of activities. The challenge is to create an anthropocentric metropolitan destination, accessible, permeable, without restrictions, a friendly place that builds on the collective memory, enhancing urbanity, aiming to create a vivid place with a diffusion of users spreading educational activities all over the area. This is the last contribution. So thanks a lot, Ivy, for your perspective, which reminds us that there are not only small projects, but there is a need really for making large projects. I'm also happy that you talked about the COVID project, because this is what we also heard from Josef Ortigas in Barcelona, that there are some projects where it's urgent Yes. And it's uh, infrastructure work, heavy infrastructure work, which has to be done to protect us from the, let's say, hazards coming from the sea. And Pegina and myself, we could attend the, uh, thank you, um, we, we could attend the. Uh, <laughs> the presentation by um, the head of the planning uh, agency of the state of Bremen. So this is one of the federal states in, uh, in, in, in Germany. And she showed us where they also have to deal with this. However, they, they said, we cannot just build this kind of protection infrastructure. We also have to do it in a different way, um, really um, giving it a, an, an added value. And then she showed us, it's already executed this, uh, this project. She showed us a really fantastic image uh, how now in the city of Bremen, a kind of beach situation, um, um, fulfilling all the technical standards, etc. however, adding a certain So thank you for this, um, and now we're getting a, a little bit um, um, uh, into the discussion because um, I, I would be encourage you also to ask questions in between you because there are different positions, there are some similarities, so this is what this panel was meant for. However, we are also opening up into the audience later on. We will take maybe like 20, 30 minutes for today to find out whether some ideas could be shared in the idea. Yeah, I, I would like to ask a question first to Ivy. Uh, Ivy uh, um, hearing all you as representatives of different stakeholders, as being um, you had been into the planning involved into the planning department here in Athens, or, or you are still, but you had been for the green planning department working. I was working uh, initially, I started working in the National Garden in the city of Athens, and now I'm at uh, the Resilience and Sustainability Department of yeah. the Strategic Division of the city of Athens. Yeah. Yeah. You are working for the academics and you are working for the building industry. So, um, as we did discuss today, um, to me it's a question of um, are there any possibilities to bring these stakeholders together? with all their knowledge, not only in a conference, but on a, um, let's say, regular basis, where, like in a forum, 
discussions are done, or does this already exist, Evie? That um, all these stakeholders come together in discussions to somehow represent all the knowledge and make conclusions or make suggestions for conclusions for planning departments, because I mean there is already so much knowledge there. So how could it be combined in the city of Athens? Well. Uh, um, First of all, I would like to clarify that uh, we are not part of the building industry. We are part of, uh, we are acting as consultants and mainly as consultants to the public sector, working constantly with the public sector, all the ministries and the municipalities all over the country. So um, our uh, our aim is to help uh, this uh, discussion, and this is the reason uh, we, we, we expressed specific positions, uh, positions that were already um, uh, delivered to the government and uh, to the municipality in, uh, in, uh, in previous periods, and we had the opportunity to discuss these same issues uh, with the mayor of, uh, of Athens uh, some time ago. So I think uh, it, is, it is a necessity to bring uh, this, uh, these issues uh, because there is a lot of knowledge, uh, there is a lot of, a lot of will, and uh, uh, we are all together to improve our lives in this country. And as you saw, and you, you may see it clearly, that the possibility to create a, a continuous cultural growth in this city related to uh, the landscape of the city, the landscape characteristics of the city, is unique. And it is so easy. It doesn't demand that tremendous work and infrastructure work. It demands another uh, view we have to open, for instance, archaeological sites. We have to take out the fences, or we have to take out, perhaps, the entrances, instead of taking out all the fences. So the archaeological site may be corridors instead of buffer zones. So this is another perception of the city, and we should start talking about that. Yes, can, can I, yes, uh, send back th this type of question to you, Regine, since this is not happening in Greece yet. Uh, what is a good example or the a better uh, practice that has happened in Munich, for example, between academia, professional world, and mm -hmm. uh, administration that maybe should, could uh, show us the way? Yeah. Um, well, I know some colleagues um, who do this catalyst work as um, consultants, bringing together all these knowledge-based uh, solutions in discussion rounds for the, for the planning departments. We, like Urban Catalyst from Berlin, he's, uh, Klaus Obermeier, he's one of the specialists in, in uh, all over Germany to bring together all these stakeholders into a discussion process to not lose all the, the knowledge and to not to lose all these very good ideas. So these are very often long, moderated processes. I'm just looking to Katja Strohecker, um, as Munich does it, for example, um, to find solutions to invite a moderator, a catalyst person who really um, supports and follows up this process over several years, uh, over several occasions, uh, conferences, um, meetups, um, together with citizens, with politicians, with investors, we did not mention them yet, um, who are very, very important stakeholders to be part of the transformation because they are driving factors. They are buying um, real estates and they are changing the city fabric. So, and very often they are willing to be part of the change in a positive way because they themselves know as well that their investment must be more ecological, must be more citizen uh, oriented. So I think it needs a moderator 
to bring all these knowledges together. Not only us as consultants, as academics, but someone who plays more or less an objective role and has no own issues within the city. And I saw that in several cities that it happens through such a moderator and it works very, very well. So this could be one conclusion to start a process which only moderates the existing knowledge to prolong a situation or to, to enhance a situation of a common uh, collective planning. I believe that uh, we should uh, have a vision for the city and the vision should be very clear and the message to the, to, to the inhabitants of the city should be very clear as well because they have, as you said, they have to participate, they have to be members of this effort. So I think that we should uh, put all our efforts uh, towards a new vision for the city. But I think the vision comes to existence through such a moderated process because every stakeholder gets a voice. And I think this is really important to, to speak up and to give persons and communities and stakeholders a voice who did probably not speak up before. Yeah. As you said, the, the people who are in areas which are in struggle, which are, are in a social problems, so they have to have a voice to, to, on, to, to give a base to such a development. Before, we, uh, said, before you answer what uh, Mike said, um, I would like to say that the city of Athens has quite a few visions regarding project-based visions. So, you know, for the uh, urban sustainability plan, there is one vision. For the climate action plan, there is a vision and some goals. For uh, the one that we have for the uh, urban accessibility plan that uh, it will be issued now, there is another one. So. Uh, it's, as Evie said, it's, it should be something interconnected. Yeah. Uh, all these strategies be in one uh, place that should be clear to everybody that that's the goal for culture, for landscape, for tourism, for the, for the accesses. And uh, to me, it seems really obvious that the, the overall and the overarching priority it is, it is the climate action plan at this moment for the city of Athens because it does have, it does address issues regarding culture, it does address issues regarding uh, uh, accessibility, regarding green spaces. And um, if there is any, uh, if there's any idea from uh, all of you on how to actually uh, mix together and have a discussion on how uh, on, and having proposals on that and then go back to the technical departments, uh, invite them oh, and get the mayor and all the people who are relevant to that, it would be nice to receive some proposal and start the conversation on that. May I just add something? What I learned in so many um, inclusive projects was that very many stakeholders speak very many different languages. And one 
piece of art is <laughs> to bring the languages together because I, as a landscape architect, has a, have another uh, language as a civil engineer, even if we think we studied similar things, yeah? And the anthropologist speaks a different language as well. Even if we are willing to collaborate, it takes quite a while and it takes quite uh, uh, an extra effort to, to get a level of understanding that the goal is the same one. You, you spoke about a goal, a common goal, but you can achieve it only if we understand each other. And it needs some translation to understand these different languages of our professions, which is sometimes quite a bit of an obstacle and we have to, aware, to be aware of that process which has to be done in such a collaborative planning process. This is, this is a lot of, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I wrote down this moderate, to moderate the existing knowledge. This point is so important. This is so important. The knowledge that exists right now in the, uh, in, in the people inside the municipality of Athens is unbelievable. So there's a lot of, there's a pool of knowledge and a pool of expertise. Um, you know, our technical departments are so efficient and so knowledgeable and they know the processes uh, that not, uh, not the academia knows about and not uh, many consultants know about. So it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's very vital that these people, that the hands-on people are getting involved in that, you know, our technical departments. It's very, very important. And uh, the reason... Um, in, in our uh, directorate, we could play um, a moderator role or a managing role somehow in that, but we need the people to actually, who would do the project with us and to, to actually agree in principle, what exactly are we proposing? Yeah. What exactly is, what do you want? So it's a process. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me explain that uh, the problem does not affect uh, only the municipality of Athens. It has to do with uh, the city the met as a metropolis. Um, and uh, the, all, all other municipalities that are affected and as the Phileon Bay project is affecting the city center as well, as well as uh, the, the project of uh, Elinicon. So we have to start discussing. This is a multidisciplinary approach and it needs all participants in the same table. Um, you are asking for a proposal. I think that the idea of uh, Le Grand Paris is a proposal um, or a discussion or um, a discussion, um, a sort of uh, putting together uh, university, the, the Polytechnic School and uh, uh, consultants and try to uh, bring a, a common vision on certain issues and discuss with the ministries because there are ministries involved, municipalities yeah, and the other yeah. stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So we have to start creating a common ground and this is very, very important. Mm -hmm.
Okay, but what about the coastal zone of Athens? <laughs> what about the coastal zone of Athens? I mean, this affects, uh, um, I don't know how many municipalities, but a lot of municipalities. And uh, uh, this is very important. Uh, it is uh, the biggest par park of uh, natural park in, uh, in Athens. And it means a lot for the citizens. And the discussion should, uh, should carry on now. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, we have expressed a specific framework to start discussion, dis to start our discussion on this issue. Mm -hmm. But there is no responsibility from uh, an entity mm -hmm. to carry on this dialogue, this the discussion. The interesting thing about landscape is that it has no borders. Landscape has no borders, it has no territorial borders, and this can include citizens, can include uh, communities, uh, municipal um, frameworks, and I think that coastal area is one very good idea to combine interests of several communities in one project, as you would use a river or as you would use a mountain range to include all the stakeholders into one interest because the overall landscape is the transporting base of the common idea. Mm -hmm. And so we come back to your title that landscape has the ability to include everyone because the landscape belongs to all of us. So it's, it's good, let's say, that we, in, in the end we find out that we need a kind of carrier perspective, which could be indeed landscape. So let's design the landscape which should be ecological, which should be social, which has to work economical too. Let's not be too naive about that too, which has to be safe, if you pointed on this. Um, so we should do a project on the landscape, right? Be it maybe in a, in a first initial project on the, on the coastal strip, be it in small projects like proposed by Spill in a student project, be it, uh, let's say, as a kind of stepping stone network, uh, as a patchwork, which obviously the city of Athens and also some neighboring communities are already developing by strengthening certain, certain projects. And maybe the historic um, elements like the National Gardens, like the um, uh, Plato's Academy of Otani Cost could be some of the elements which are then revitalized. So, before closing the discussion now, because we want, I think all of us want to have drinks and we want to have a discussion with you also so that you contribute with your ideas to the discussion. We're collecting it and try to feed it back in tomorrow's discussion where we develop these ideas a little bit further. Are there some pressing questions we should discuss here in the plenary session? Because otherwise, uh, you're, I'm, well, I'm all inviting you for having a drink outside and speaking a little bit more and also asking the presenters today, but are there some pressing questions we should discuss right now here on stage? Tassos, you have a pressing question. Can I just lend the mic? I expected this. You wanted to go for drinks? No. <laughs> <coughs> well, thank you very much. I think it's all, all four very inspiring. I'm not... Um, I just wanted to ask, to, because I think it's also I mean, the, the, the aspects you're raising here are very important. What is the relation to the border of the municipality? This was because we're talking about intermunicipal projects and how can we combine it, but we know, of course, that when it comes maybe to uh, how we treat our own house, so to say, maybe the house of the opposite municipality it treats it the other way. So do you kind of talk with the others? How do you go into... Um... That's for you, Elisabeth, I'm sorry, yes. Okay. Um, the responsibility of the projects that we do uh, have to do, has to, have to, has to do with inside, in, in boundary. Um, there are projects uh, that uh, we are in collaboration with neighborhood, uh, neighboring uh, um, city halls. 
uh, but quite limited because our jurisdiction. I'm just talking on the um, on what's happening in 95% of the project of the city. So the real responsibility is inside our uh, administration, is inside our boundaries. Um, and for our, even for our projects that we do in the city, especially the ones that have to do with traffic arrangements and, uh, uh, and uh, the Ministry of Culture, uh, archaeological spaces, because you, Evie, you did talk a lot about archaeological spaces and uh, breaking down the fences of the, of, of the spaces. So it's not our jurisdiction. But we we have opened up bridges and talking to to various bodies about issues uh, that have to do with the Ministry of Culture, quite a lot of them, and um, with many of the ministries and responsibilities, and the Ministry of Transport and the decentralized government, especially on traffic arrangement, which has been uh, uh, very vital for a lot of circulation and green projects for the city. Mm. This is a very important question you asked, Tassos, and um, I maybe uh, Katja Stroecker, who is presenting tomorrow also the tw Step 2040, a little bit more in detail. Maybe you can tell us how Munich is dealing with the situation that some things have to be negotiated with the others in the region and where we can be successful and where there are also some, let's say, resistance to making an agreement, because I, I assume that this is not too easy to be all on the same side. But we are, we are really uh, looking forward to hearing something from you from, let's say, practical experience about that too. Are there other questions? Okay, so if not, save them for informal discussion outside. First, thanks to you that you contributed to this discussion, Regine, for coming from Munich and giving your idea about the landscape and the colleagues here from, from Greece bringing in their own perspective and I hope that we can go on with the discussion tomorrow. I hope that you enjoyed the first day. We will now um, have some drinks and I said discussion, you're all invited. Please also have a look into the book again. Um, as said before, we cannot sell it here in Greece for tax reasons. So um, you have to order it uh, online or address us at, at the chair. We meet again tomorrow at 5. <laughs> We meet tomorrow again at 5 in this venue, not in the next building, because it's easier from the setup. And then we will go on with the discussion where we involve a lot of contributors from, from academia and other fields, also bringing in some fresh insights, which we haven't heard. Um, I'm really looking forward for tomorrow's discussion, and you're all welcome to come back tomorrow. Let's have a drink. Yes. I know about so maybe you can tell Tasso that he is doing the moderation tomorrow.